let's talk about buying in. In every game, a player will, at some point, lose control, because the game has stuff to say, and so at some point there will be a cutscene, or a new mode, or a new level, or a pop-up window, or something that takes control away from the player, right? Partially or wholly, at some point the game takes over and the player has to listen because the game has something to say. The secret to this is that the player has to give permission. And that's what this video is about. The player has to buy in to any loss of control. They don't have to, technically. If you want to make their adrenaline pump or do something emotional in the late game, you can kind of force stuff onto them. But for the most you know, the majority of the game, you're going to want to ask permission anytime you plan to take any control away from the player. Not only do they have to buy in, they have to buy in the precise amount to match the amount of control they're losing. It's not complicated, but it is nuanced. So let's talk about it. Here's an anecdote, which I think is true, but it's been a while since I looked it up. We're playing GTA. Driving around in cars, robbing banks, whatever, right? Zoom. There is a part of GTA where you lose control. And it's not when the cops are chasing you. It's when you have to do a side mission. The side missions are a big loss of control. They dictate that you must do this particular thing in this particular way. It's like five minutes of, of time that you don't really have free roam anymore. You can't really run around robbing banks anymore. You have to do whatever the game wants you to do. Back in ye old days, players hated these because they just started, and the players always felt like it was ripping them out of the game. The game was talking over them rather than talking with them. No matter how good the rewards are for doing these missions, the players always felt like these missions were being foisted on them. They were being forced to, uh, to just do these random things that didn't matter to them at all. How do you make these missions matter? Well... They added a glowing green circle. Drive into the circle and the mission starts. Sounds good, right? Now the player knows that the mission's going to come. They can go off and do whatever they want to do for as long as they want, and then eventually they can drive into the glowing green circle and do the mission. Sounds great. But it's not about the freedom to wander around the world for as long as they want. It's about giving you permission to take away their, their freedom. And driving into a glowing green circle wasn't enough permission. The mission is a big ask. Five minutes, ten minutes of time that the player is not free to do whatever they were doing. They're, they're forced to do something else. It's a big ask. And simply moving into a space is a small amount of buy-in. It wasn't enough to match the amount of time that the missions were taking. Go into the glowing green circle and hit A. Holy shit, suddenly everybody loves the missions. What? So, the secret here is that the buy-in finally matches the mission's length. The player knows that if they're in a glowing green circle, a special place, and they hit A, they're going to lose five minutes of their life. They're saying, yeah, okay, game, I trust you. Lay it on me. We'll do what you want to do for five minutes. This works great, and it's why literally every open-world action game does this. It's, uh, it's just the way that you ask permission for doing missions. Missions take up quite a bit of time, and you need to get enough permission to, to kind of even that out. But this is not a GTA-specific thing. It's not a genre-specific thing. Every genre does this. You're playing Fridge McShooter Face with your big gun, and you're shooting up monsters. Pow, pow. When does the game ask permission? When does the game get you to buy in? How about when you uh, go into an elevator and you click on a button to make the elevator go up and down? That's a massive amount of buy-in. You're going to a very special place. You're clicking on a very specific part of the wall. That's more buy-in than, uh, than the devs of the GTA games were getting for their full missions. Because not only are you in a special place and pressing A, you're in a special place and pressing A while looking at a specific object. That's a lot of buy-in. And the game 
has to match that with a requisite amount of loss of control. You have to you have to you have to have that loss of control match the buy-in or the player will feel unhappy. So that's why all of these elevator rides are tense. That's why they all have enemies attacking you from everywhere or they're short and then the door opens and then the enemies attack you from everywhere. Elevator rides are inherently a super huge amount of buy-in. So they had better be a super huge amount of loss of control. How about doors, right? You go over to a door. Well, some doors just kind of open. They're just like, oh, there's a person nearby. Shweep, we opened. That's very similar to driving into a green circle. You drive into the green circle, the mission starts. Oh, same here. You drive in, you, you walk over the door, the door opens, swoop. And of course, now the rest of the level, or big chunk of the level, is now active. And you can see it, and you can interact with it. This is fine, as long as that change is small and relatively passive, because walking up to something is not a big buy-in. It's a small buy-in. So if you were to walk up to a door and it would swoop open and then a massive like centipede monster comes flying out and rams into you at full speed, you're going to feel blindsided. And maybe that's what you want. If it's a horror game, that, that can work really well. But for the most part, walking up to a door and having it automatically open means that those automatic doors don't have any massive sudden losses of control on the other side. Because it's a small buy-in. But not all doors are like that. What about this door leading from the garage out into the Arctic wastelands? I've got to find a fuse and a four key cards and holy shit, I spent 10 minutes trying to open this door. That's a big buy-in. This door had better be game-changing because I spent the last 10 minutes trying to get it open. When it opens, there had better be something amazing. I had better lose a lot of control when that door opens, because that's how much I bought into your story. You better tell me something amazing. You better give me something for this game. I want to I wanna hear back from you. I've, I've given you all of this buy-in. Come on, you got my ear. Sell me. How about health packs and, uh, you know, bullets? You just kind of walk over them. You use your magic pants to hoover them up. The heck? What's up with that? Well, the reason that action games do that these days is because if you had to click on them, that would be buy-in. But they're not taking control away from you. So you don't want buy-in. It just feels boring if you buy into something and then all you get is like press plus three health or whatever. That's why you've got your magic hoover pants. You walk over these things and suck them up passively because there's no loss of control. So there's no buy-in. If you had to click on them, there would be buy-in, and you would expect a loss of control, and then when your loss of control led to something banal that happens a million times in each level, you're gonna feel kind of cheated. So, that's why nearly every action game, you have magic hoover pants. Pretty easy peasy, right? This continues on pretty much forever. So, for example, you are playing a, a walking sim. There's a note on the desk. You walk over to the note. Hello, note. You click on the note to pick it up. You're expecting to lose control for three seconds. You pick up the note, you look at the note, the screen pops up the text of the note, you read it, you put it back down. That's the expectation for clicking on this note. And when you buy into that, if the game doesn't deliver exactly that, you're gonna feel annoyed. Like, oh, if you pick up the note and there's a 15 minute cutscene, you're gonna be like, I did not sign up for this. This is way too much loss of control for clicking on a random note. And if you click on the note and your player just goes, Ugh. that's also going to feel like a betrayal because you expected to get something out of that click. A click is you saying, I understand the context of the situation. Let me engage. So if your understanding of the context is that you're going to pick up the note and read it, you better pick up the note and read it. Anything else that happens is extra and probably unwelcome but this is no ordinary note this is the desk underneath the knife chandelier there's blood draining off the desk and skulls everywhere on the sides ah alien skulls apparently ah, and there's glowing runes on the on the note yeah okay 
Now when you click on the note and you're saying, I understand the context of the situation, you're thinking, yeah, this is like a 15 minute note. I understand game. Come on, lay it on me. Lay it on me. Give me, give me, give me what you got. Give me that 15 minute cutscene and that teleportation to hell or whatever, whatever is going to happen. This buy-in, this understanding of this of this mechanic is critical, especially in with walking simulators, because a lot of walking simulators, I'm calling them walking simulators, you know, narrative adventure games, a lot of these games will just lay backstory on you. They'll be like, oh, here's a 15-minute cutscene because you walked down a hallway. That is usually going to be a bad call because the player didn't buy in to a 15-minute cutscene. But if you arrange it a little bit differently and you actually ask the player's permission, they'll be happy to see that 15-minute cutscene. They'll be ecstatic that the game has something to say, but you have to get their permission first. They have to know that 15-minute cutscene is coming. Let's talk about a more complicated example. Let's talk about a game I love, Paradise Killer. Paradise Killer is, uh, is basically a walking sim on fast forward. It's like a walking sim collectathon mixed with uh, Phoenix Wright, you know, that sort of thing. If you haven't played it, I've got a walkthrough, or walkthrough, I've got an LP of it, and I've also, I also just recommend it if you like psychedelic games. Um, and it's all about picking stuff up. And every time you pick something up, you click on it, right? They're, every single thing you pick up is a click interaction. And they're just kind of lying around in places, right? Every single one of them is a short loss of control because you pop it up on your screen and it tells you what it is. You quickly learn that this is like a three second blurb. You pick it up, you see some fun little blurb, and then you move on with the game. There's even some monster dudes. And if you click on them, they will be pithy at you for three seconds or five seconds. And then you move on with the game. You quickly understand the context of clicking. This is what clicking means. It means that you're going to get three second sound bites, five second sound bites. And those are, are really great interactions. But unfortunately, Paradise Killer has some gotchas because some of these, this one over here, this one is a bottle of whiskey. And when you pick that up, congratulations, you have now triggered a 40 second long cutscene. Hmm. You had no way of knowing that it was going to be a 40 second long cutscene. Technically, the, the bottles of whiskey are a different pickup than the rest. They, they have a different visual, but it's a very subtle difference. So I think that a lot of people are probably going to be a little bit flat footed by the sudden loss of 40 seconds of control because they are no longer picking something up and looking at it. They're picking something up and getting swept away to a cutscene. And then they're getting the blurb. It's not terrible. If it was terrible, I wouldn't consider Paradise Killer to be such a killer game, but uh, it is noticeable. And of course, this extends to people as well. So this demon guy is like a five second back and forth. But this demon guy is like a good seven or eight minutes of dialogue where you click down a million different options. And you wouldn't really expect that when you clicked on them. If you're used to Demon Guy A, and then you click on Demon Guy B, and it's a completely different result, even though they're both the same interaction in the same context, right? There's only two characters in the game, or maybe three, where interacting with them is is uh, on the level where you would expect, right? If you go and you talk to the architect, her interaction is about on par with what you expect because it's annoying to get to her. You actually have to put in some effort and really buy in to talk to her. But pretty much everybody else is just kind of hanging out in the same way the demon would. And when you talk to them, it's a you know long sequence. You know, the buy-in doesn't match. We're trained to expect a specific kind of buy-in, and the context does not really change when you're talking to people or picking up bottles of whiskey. But even though context is the same, the result is radically different. So it's just a little bit of a, a little bit of a clash. It certainly does not ruin the game, but it is something where um, you really get a sense that, that there is a little bit of a, I gotta talk to somebody moment, you know? So this is something that it's best to get right. It's best to understand that when you are taking control away from the player for any reason, you need to get the right amount of buy-in first. If talking to these people was a little bit more oomphy, 
maybe it would be a little bit more natural. Like, I don't know, maybe they, maybe they should be in glowing green circles. Let's get a little bit more hmm, interesting, right? How about game modes? Let's talk about games where you have different modes that you go through. Let's talk about a game where you build a boat. So you're in the boat building, um, you know, garage, putting your boat together. You've built your boat up to the point where you need to know how it actually works. You know, put the engine together. Let's check if the engine works. What do you do? Well, you switch modes, right? You go and you click on that simulate button or that launch button, and then it launches you into the game world. And then you can see how your, your engine works. Well, this is the same sort of action that we've been talking about. You're clicking on a button to change the mode of the game. And I say it's the same kind of interaction. You're telling the game, you're buying in to a massive mode switch, and the game is saying, okay, let's take you somewhere else. Let's make something different happen. But you're buying in a very specific amount because your click tells the game that you understand the context. And in this case, the context is, I want to test this boat I created. The context is not, I would like to be launched into battle, or I would like to spawn, you know, at a random location or anything like that. The game understands that you want to test this thing you've been creating, so it puts you in a relatively safe, known environment to do those tests. It's that easy. But this does make it difficult to create a version of this game where you can spawn into complicated environments. Like, I want to test this while it's falling off uh, a waterfall, or I want to take this spaceship into combat. You want to take the spaceship into combat, how are you going to set that up? It's going to be an arduous task where you tell the game how much combat you want to be in. Well, that's kind of the crux of how you have to communicate with the player. How do you get the player to buy in to the mode switches? How much control does the game have versus how much control does the player have? How much can be construed just by the order in which the modes unroll? And of course, this has nothing to say about uh, games where the mode switching is more fluid. For example, in Space Engineers, when you're building your ship, there's no actual mode switching in the game. Like, the game is always just the game. But the player is mode switching. The player goes from building to driving, then to building again. How does the player communicate that? By clicking. Yeah, that's right. The, cl the player will go to a special place on the boat or the spaceship, and they will click on the controls. And they know what to expect. They're going to get a different form of play. They're buying into it via um, a special place they created. I think that this whole discussion is really fun and interesting, and I really hope that when you take control away from the player, you do it in a way that makes the player happy. And I think this is the secret to that. But let me know what you think. Bye.